So since Father Peter is very fond of um, advertisement and so forth at the Shepisky Institute, I am a sessional lecturer with the Institute. My name is Father Michael. I'm also the rector of Holy Spirit Ukrainian Catholic Seminary in Ottawa. I have to do that plug in as well. Our seminarians uh, take their theological studies with the Institute and have been for a very long time. Father Andrich Drozki is the founder of the Metropolitan and Shepisky Institute of Eastern Christian Studies. From 1984 to 1990, he taught at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, where the Institute was founded in 1986. And since 1990, that's when he came to Ottawa, he's been teaching at St. Paul University, where at uh, present, uh, has been for some time as well, he is a full professor holding the Peter and Doris Kuhl Chair of Eastern Christian Theology and Spirituality. He's a member of the Faculty of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies of the University of Ottawa. He serves as a theological advisor to his Beatitude, Patriarch Svetoslav, the author of many books and many articles and book chapters. Father Andri is, uh, focuses his attention on spirituality, Ecclesio ecclesiological and ecumenical issues involving the Church of Kiyu and the theological and pastoral inter interpretation of icons. He is the editor-in-chief of Logos, the Journal of Eastern Christian Studies. And I hope this is what you wanted. I'll see you soon. That's <laughs> <laughs> Father Peter. Thank you very much, Father Michael. Um, speaking about theologizing uh, as an Eastern Catholic, I have to mention the fact that uh, probably the best-selling issue of Logos, the G Journal of Eastern Christian Studies, was the uh, second issue of uh, 1998 because it is in that issue of Logos that we published uh, four papers from the 1998 Catholic uh, Theological Society of America meeting in Ottawa, where uh, Father Robert Taft, Father Peter Galazza, Father Miroslav Tatarin, and I, moderated by Professor Yaroslav Skira, uh, delivered our reflections on what Eastern Catholic theology might be. I also need to mention that a very interesting volume, I would have brought that Logos, but you know when you're traveling by air there's just so much weight that you can carry. Um, a very interesting, very recent publication um, Volume 14 of Orientalia uh, et uh, Occidentalia, um, published by the uh, Michael Lotsko uh, Institute, uh, is called Selected Questions and Perspectives on the Theology in the Eastern Churches United with Rome. Now here, those four papers from Logos are republished, but there are ten other papers uh, on this subject. So, if anyone is intrigued by this question, I would suggest that you uh, look this book up. And uh, even though some of it is in Slovak, uh, if, you've, if, if you're Ukrainian and you've ever run into a Lemko, you should be able to, <laughs> you should be able to read the Slovak, okay? Um, so that is a, you know, a thing that needs to be taken into account. Um, theologizing as an Eastern Catholic after Orientalium Ecclesiarum also entails theologizing after Lumen Gentium, after Unitatis Ered Integratium, I would hope after Gaudium et Spes, although we pay a lot more attention to the, to the previous two than we do to Gaudium et Spes on the church in the modern world, something that we should do more of uh, rather than simply um, 
always looking retrospectively or trying to solve identity questions. Um, it depends on um, the, the theologizing after Vatican II is also theologizing after the Code of Canons of the Eastern Churches of 1990. Uh, the 1995 uh, writings of Pope John Paul II, Orientale Lumen, which Father Brian mentioned, and Ut Unum Sint. Uh, the 1996 instructions by the uh, Congregation for the Eastern Churches on how to adapt uh, the liturgical prescriptions according to the Code of Canons of the Eastern Churches. And also, the Orthodox Catholic International Dialogue, the regional dialogues, and uh, local initiatives, which includes things like the Kievan Church Study Group, of the mid-1990s, and the so-called Zogby Initiative, uh, in which both members of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church and the Malkite Greek Catholic Church explored the possibilities of double communion. In other words, being in communion with uh, the See of Rome, and with their own uh, Orthodox mother churches, even before worldwide Catholicism and Orthodoxy have uh, totally reestablished their communion. It, it is in that light that I'd like to put forward uh, an idea that I have been uh, nurturing in my heart for some time. Father Brian has put forward a positive evaluation of the word uniate and uniatism, which I appreciate. Uh, Patriarch Miroslav Ivan Cardinal Lubachivsky was once asked what he thought about that word, the U word. And uh, he said, well, we're all about union. We want uh, union. That's what we live for. I guess maybe we are union. Uh, maybe that's okay. And if it's presented in the kind of perspective that Father Brian Daly uh, just presented, then I could live with that too. Uh, I've been mulling over the, the thought of identifying myself um, as a communionist uh, instead of a, a uniate because it is communion with all the positive associations of Eucharistic ecclesiology and communion of churches rather than any kind of reductio in obedientiam which characterized that bad unionism. Uh, it, I would call myself a communionist. And uh, uh, this re reminds me of a, a conversation I had in, on a bus in Lviv, in Ukraine. This was uh, in the uh, early 1990s, and this one little old woman came up to me and he said, what is this that I hear that you're preaching, as she said with the Ukrainian pronunciation, ecumenism? And I said, well, well, yes, that's a very good thing. She says, well, we just got rid of communism, and now you want to give us <laughs> ecumenism. And I said, no, not quite. Not quite. Um, each of uh, the, the previous list of influences had had, has had significant impact on the theologizing of Eastern Catholics sometimes amplifying possibilities, sometimes restricting or attempting to restrict possibilities, wittingly or unwittingly, as in the case of the Code of Canons of the Eastern Churches, the CCEO, considered by many, and I think justly so, a Latin document for Eastern Christians. 
in today's situation precisely because of the liberating character of Orientalium Ecclesiarum, attempts to rein in Eastern Catholics often result in even more resoluteness on the part of Eastern Catholics to find acceptable solutions to bothersome questions that are more often than not of an ecclesiological nature. The whole notion of Eastern Catholic theologizing almost inevitably gets entangled in ecclesiological issues because Therein lies what Václav Hrynevich refers to as the original sin of unionism, of the less than successful attempts by various Eastern churches to restore communion with the West, specifically with the Church of Rome. Whether the less than successful attempt is based on Roman proselytism, or on the desperate desire of a church like the Metropoli of Kiev, uh, because of its difficult situation uh, in the face of Socinian and other uh, reform movements, or in the face of a, a Jesuit Catholic onslaught to reaffirm communion with Rome at the height of the Counter-Reformation, when Rome's exclusivist ecclesiology and soteriology fundamentally distorted this attempt by the Metropolia of Kiev. Whatever it was, and I think it's a bit of all of those, uh, this attempt left the Kievan hierarchy in the position of paying too little attention to Orthodox sister churches. Even those churches which did not understand themselves ever to have foregone communion with Rome, like the Maronites or uh, in some accounts the Thomas Christians in India, when they reactivated this communion, were essentially received through what Ernst Sutner calls reductio in obedientia. Thus, uh, Eastern Catholic theologizing, whether consciously or not, is always operating in the context of what Malkite Patriarch Maximus referred to as the bleeding womb of the East-West Rift. Roman theologizing still today too often blissfully ignores the very existence of this wound, as if it could be so easily relegated to the waste heap of history with preference, preference given to what Rowan and Martin's Laffin used to present as the church of what's happening now. Orthodox theologians are usually more aware of this wound on the body of Christ, but too often they respond in, I said too often, not always, too often though, they respond in an antagonistic, polemical manner, self-satisfied in the beautiful integrity of a holistic orthodoxy that really has little need for the West. Eastern Catholics do not have the luxury of such splendid isolation. To use a metaphor from British 19th century foreign policy, or to put it in a more local mode of speech, to accept the two solitudes that uh, we here in Canada know as Anglophone and Francophone world. The metaphor of bridge has often been ascribed to Eastern Catholics, usually with a proselytizing accent. Eastern Catholics usually reject this metaphor, not the least because a bridge is something that gets walked all over. And we have been stepped on quite enough, thank you very much. <laughs>
I prefer the image of catalyst for east-west understanding and rapprochement. But that east-west bifurcation can never be far from our thoughts. It just cannot be. It's right at the heart of our existence. In my 1998 article, Orthodox in Communion with Rome, the Antinomic Character of Eastern Catholic Theology, I focused on the, the antinomic paradoxical uh, approach of emphasizing the necessity for Eastern Catholics to see Orthodox theological positions as their own, except when their positions point to a contradiction between Orthodoxy and a given Roman teaching. It's my contention that the difference between Orthodox and Eastern Catholic theology lies precisely in the fact that while Orthodox theologians in light of the schism between East and West, can legitimately consider a given uh, officially taught Roman doctrine as simply wrong, Eastern Catholics, on the other hand, by virtue of the, quote, full and visible communion, unquote, that pertains between them and Rome, cannot make such claims without putting in jeopardy this full and visible communion, or at least making it hyper hypocritical. Instead, Eastern Catholics can legitimately start from orthodox starting points in their theologizing, but must um, adequately, I would say, face an additional burden. Their communion with Rome requires them to treat disagreeable Roman teaching as complementary rather than contradictory. This may initially seem like a convenient cop-out, but it really isn't, because it requires that Eastern Catholics to do the difficult work of showing how both the Orthodox and the Roman positions, both and, have inherent value to them how they need one another, and should therefore not be treated as a binary reality in which uh, a theologian must choose either one or the other. This is why I see Eastern Catholic theology as a catalyst for East-West rapprochement. It is inherently dialogical. Valerian Bugel, in this volume, in an article written in Sloha, has rejected my formulation in his article, uh, and I'm going to slaughter this probably, I'm, I'm pronouncing it like a Ukrainian word, but it's Slova, Minus Asuchasnos Vychodni Katoliski Teologie Ne Kolko Systematizujucich Poznamok Z Pokusom O Vedra Do Budučnosti. Um, a, uh, the, the past and the present of Eastern Catholic theology, um, several systematizing uh, characteristics and an attempt at uh, looking at the future. Of course, he recognizes that I'm not alone in this uh, ecumenically centered approach even though uh, I think that I have stated it most um, brusquely, but he seems to bristle at those who like to invoke the Eastern Congregation's 1996 instruction for the application of the liturgical prescriptions of the Code of Canons of the Eastern Churches, where it is mentioned that, where possible, Eastern Catholics should use the same liturgical texts as the Orthodox. This really bothers him. He says that this antinomic approach that I espouse uh, of Eastern Catholics identifying with Orthodox theological approaches while taking into account and valorizing their full and visible communion with Rome does not do justice to another delicate balance that needs to be sought, the balance between what Google calls often antiquated 
traditions, no value judgment there, right? Um, and enculturation. If he is calling for an organic response to contemporary challenges on the part of the Eastern churches, all of the Eastern churches, uh, those in communion with Rome and those not in communion with Rome, then I can hardly agree about the need for that balance. If he is intimating that Eastern Catholics might want to go at it alone, then I fear that this would be a repetition of the understandable but ultimately unfortunate in certain very real ways move by the Orthodox bishops of the Kievan Metropolia in 1596 to go it alone. Even though they ingenuously ask in the 33 articles of the guarantees that they needed from Rome, in Article 13, that when the rest of the brethren of our people and the Greek religion shall come into this same holy unity, they ask that their rushing ahead should not be held against them. In fact, it has definitely been held against them. And the Eastern Catholic churches have been portrayed and continue to be portrayed often enough as at best misguided and at worst an aberrant and destructive force that is by no means uh, a real church. Miroslav Tatarin has taken a different approach to the question of enculturation uh, among the Eastern Catholic Churches, a term, incidentally, that he finds ultimately unhelpful. He doesn't like talking about uh, Eastern Catholic Churches in some generic fashion, because it, it, that does not do enough to highlight the particular cultural identity, identities of the various churches in communion with Rome, since he operates out of a Lanarganian definition of theology as hinging on quote, a cultural matrix and the significance and role of religion in that matrix, unquote. That leads him to accept even the most excruciatingly Thomistic theological works by members of the Eastern churches, like the Ukrainian Catholic Church, as authentically Eastern Catholic theology. I, I just cannot agree. To be fair, he also applies categories from Pablo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed and shows how it was the marginalization and reduction to the condition of the vague other in the Catholic Church that led to such, quote, blatantly Western-inspired theologizing. Like Lonergan, Tatarin emphasizes the dialogic and historical over the classicist, arguing that both uh, Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy have had their share of classicist emphasis, which takes historically bound thought and treats it as if it had been universally held and universally applicable. I believe a little more nuance needs to be injected into that particular discussion. Roman Catholics, especially after Cardinal Newman, have pretty much accepted the notion of doctrinal development. Orthodox thinkers tend to shy away from the notion, especially so named, focusing on the once and for all revelation and apostolic charisma, whose uh, exposition, expression, phrasing, etc., may show signs of development, but fundamentally um, they feel very uncomfortable with the idea of theological development. Now, except for Newman's ultimate focus on the role of the Pope of Rome in deciding controversial issues, I think that if they could just let their guard down for a little while. Um, I think the most Orthodox would, in fact, feel comfortable with most of Newman's exposition 
of development and therefore of at least some level of historicity even if they reject the term doctrinal development. Of course, as I mentioned, they would not accept an infallible teaching role for the Pope. And this is where we need to ask a question about how the Orthodox do arrive at something approaching the security of what Catholics call the magisterium. I repeat that this helps the Orthodox to arrive at something approaching this level of certainty rather than actually being detailed cert certain teachings since there really is no magisterium in the Orthodox churches. I believe we can say that there are two ways that Orthodox theology can and does arrive at some level of certainty. Even though the East prefers apophaticism, not saying things over cataphaticism, uh, positive statements. Uh, the first approach is what I would call the intersection of um, the, the intersection among elements of holy tradition. If one can find enough witnesses among the various elements of tradition, scripture with its unique role both within and above tradition, liturgy slash sacraments, uh, conciliar degrees, patristic writings, iconography, hagiography, canons, then if you have enough intersections and you find an issue that really is reflected in all of those, um, then that gives one a sufficient level of security that a given teaching is indeed orthodox. The other part of this intersection of elements of holy tradition is the intersection of fundamental antinomies which precisely find their intersection in a single point. Uh, then that gives further security to the thought process. Let's, let's look at a critical example. The antinomies of divine transcendence and imminence intersects with the antinomy of um, the essence of God, unreachable essence, and the, and the activity, the energia of, of, of God that we can participate in, and the antinomy of threeness and oneness in God, which also intersects with the antinomy of divine grace and initiative on the one hand, and free human response and synergia, cooperation. On the other, the antinomy of complete union of um, the human being with God, intention with the retention of human personhood, all of this comes together or intersects within the antinomy of the divine and the human in Christ. It intersects within the mystery of the incarnation. One could easily add to the list of intersecting antinomies that fit into this very framework, anthropological, soteriological, mariological doctrines that all can be made to line up like spokes on a vast bicycle wheel of intersecting truths. If you look at the center of those intersecting spokes, you have a very secure notion of what is really true without any uh, pronouncements on that subject by some official whether it is in the name of the Bishop of Rome or he, him speaking uh, for himself. That's the intersection model. So that's the, the first. Um, several of the ecclesiological antinomies that fit into that construction stand up. Among them is the corporate versus personal model of the living appropriation of truth. This has profound ramifications for an understanding of reception, which is a tremendously important ecclesiological idea. When you have a conciliar decision, it's got to be received by the church. And it's closely tied into the antinomy of how the work of the Son and the Spirit come together. The Son 
redeems human nature, the spirit active, activates this in the many human persons. Then there's the allied antinomy of sobornos, which includes the necessity on the one hand of common hierarchical action in synods or councils, and on the other hand, the reaction to this hierarchical synodal decision-making by the whole church, including the broadest consideration of laity. And the orthodox notion currently accepted, especially since it is necessary to explain the rejection by the orthodox of the Council of Florence, conciliar decisions made by the hierarchy need to be, so to speak, ratified by the lower clergy and laity at large in order to qualify as being received. It's very different from what the Catholic Church teaches, what the Roman Church teaches about when the decisions of a council uh, are binding. Now, put that in antinomic tension with the Roman position on that, that subordinate model in tension with the Roman position on when conciliar decrees are considered to be enforced and, they, and how they are to be received. And there you arrive at the very heart of the antinomic task of Eastern Catholic theologians to find how these two notions can be held at the same time. If you believe in the two lungs metaphor that Pope John Paul II liked to use and that very well may have come from Yves Congar, or the one I prefer, the left brain and the right brain, um, and after all, who wants to be a halfway, right? <laughs> if you have half a brain, you should want to use the whole brain, right? Um, if, if, if you believe in these metaphors uh, for how the church needs to think, breathe, act, then this becomes a sort of mandate for Eastern Catholic theologists. Finding a balanced antinomic formulation that does justice simultaneously to Roman and at the very same time to Orthodox expressions of doctrine. Now I could give examples from Trinitarian thought, especially around the dread filioque, but we already know that that's not really a church dividing issue. Um, or from Mariological doctrines and the supposed conflict between the Roman and Orthodox positions on the conception or the uh, assumption of marrying. But really, these are not the stumbling blocks in the way of Orthodox Catholic reconciliation today. What is the real impediment to Orthodox Catholic rapprochement is the understanding of what constitutes the legitimate exercise of the authority of the Pope of Rome. And let's, let's look at that briefly and in an impressionist manner. Eastern Catholics are required by their full and visible communion with Rome to take very seriously Roman teaching on the authority and ultimately the infallibility of the Pope. To take it very seriously. But Eastern Catholics are simultaneously required to operate within the, quote, institutions, liturgical rites, ecclesiastical traditions and the established standards of the Christian life of the Eastern churches, for in them, distinguished as they are for their venerable antiquity, there remains conspicuous the tradition that has been handed down from the apostles through the fathers and that forms part of the divinely revealed and undivided heritage of the universal church. And that was a quote from the first paragraph of Orientalium Ecclesiarum. So yes, you have to accept this teaching about the role of the Pope, but the Ecumenical Council is telling us that we have to come at it from this perspective, because it is divinely revealed and apostolically taught, and it is part of the heritage of the Universal Church. That part, which no one is better suited to put forward 
than those who have paid a price for it with their own blood. Let's face it, the Ukrainian Catholic Church was completely uh, silenced for almost half a century precisely because those crazy Ukrainian Catholics would not renounce the Pope. Uh, Patriarch Yosef, Cardinal Slipi, spent 18 years in Siberian concentration camps precisely because he would not renounce the Pope. So, even if some of us ultimately get hauled in front of the congregation for the doctrine of the faith, we're doing this. This paragraph should embolden us to interpret Roman teaching on the papacy from a perspective that might be quite different from the Roman interpretation. And just because they put forward something doesn't mean that they have the only interpretation of it. I've been married long enough to know that when something happens, my wife may see it in a very different light than I do, even though it happened between the two of us. And uh, sure, the Roman interpretation must be taken seriously, but that's not the only one. I think I have to believe, by virtue of the full and visible communion that I have so often mentioned in this paper, in the universal jurisdiction of the Pope. However, I should never constrain myself to interpret what is happening in any given exercise of that jurisdiction to what the Roman Curia thinks is happening. So here I'll give you some biblical warrant for this. Israel gets hauled off into exile. This is a horrible thing, right? But it was actually God's intervention in Israelite history in order to make for them a more glorious future. Jesus gets crucified. This is a horrible thing. And yet it is the ultimate life-giving victory on that cross. So just because somebody thinks they know what is happening, in a given issue doesn't mean that that exhausts the fullness of what that represents. Okay, so one can use the concrete example here of the nomination of Eastern Catholic bishops outside the territories, the homelands, a euphemism for reservations. Okay, <laughs> you, if you want us to treat you like white people, when you move into the cities, among us white people, then you're going to have to play by our rules. You can have your rules on the reservation, but once you come out here, we're going to call the shots, okay? That's, that the, the Roman Curia interprets this process of the nomination of Eastern Catholic bishops outside the territories as the exercise of the universal jurisdiction of the Pope. Now, from an Eastern Christian perspective, I can interpret this as one of many possible interventions aimed at preventing, at least partial, or curbing the single most paralyzing problem of orthodoxy today, overlapping and competing jurisdictions. So that's what I see happening when the Holy See says, okay, we got these names from the Synod of Bishops of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church, and we're going to tell you which one of them is going to be a bishop and where. What I see happening is, whether they know it or not, they are at the service of the Holy Spirit who wants to prevent the kind of jurisdictional chaos that plagues the ortho our Orthodox brothers and sisters, so much so that it has to be at the top 
of the agenda of the upcoming Holy Synod of the Orthodox Church. It's the number one issue. I could go on. But I would like to hear what people here have to say uh, uh, on this issue. I'm just exploring these things. And maybe you have something to add or some way to curb me in where I've gotten a little bit too enthusiastic. Or maybe I've misstated something. So I do want to leave at least a few minutes for that. Thank you for your attention. This, would anyone? I mean, if I can challenge Rome, you can challenge me, right? Uh, please. I, I like very much what you say. Uh, one of the things that the Eastern churches might help uh, the Latin church with, while we have thought a great, or spoken a great deal about reception, we really have never taken non reception seriously. Secondly, uh, Mark deals with the Middle East, and you talk about overlapping Orthodox jurisdiction. There are five Catholic bishops in a left. So. Right. Um, I certainly don't want to say that the Eastern Catholics don't have this problem, but I do see um, that you know it, it's all historically bound, whether on the Orthodox side of the equation or the Eastern Catholic side of the equation. But I do see Rome as, whether they know it or not, trying to resolve some of these issues uh, for us. Um, just like uh, I think that things like the Union of Brest uh, were meant by, were allowed by the Lord in order to put us in the position that we are currently in. Um, so that um, we could exercise this uh, catalytic effect uh, in uh, East-West relations, even though most people think that Eastern Catholics are the single greatest impediment, probably great, a greater impediment than the uh, question of the authority of the Pope of Rome. It's the existence of these, uh, these uniates. Uh, now, the question of reception, you know, I, for example, don't believe that uh, councils like Trent and Vatican I were ever received by Eastern Catholics. Why? Because at that point in history, they weren't allowed to theologize out of their own sources. So they were crippled, they weren't able to receive it. They might have, it might have been spoken at them. It might have been translated into their language, but that's hardly reception. Reception is not a passive reality. It's an active one. If you give me something, I have to take it. That's an action on my part. You can't just throw it at me and say, there you have it. Remember when, when Judas throws the 30 silver pieces into the, uh, it, it, to the Sanhedrin, they don't want to touch it. So you know, go buy a you know, potter's field with that. Um, there's none reception. We have to take that seriously. And, and so it is my contention, and I know not everyone agrees with this, but it's my contention that uh, certain councils certainly were not received by uh, the Eastern Catholic Churches. Father John? Just briefly on the same subject, uh, there is a wonderful Latin phrase, quid quid recipitur ad modum recipientis recipiunt, uh, reci <laughs> excuse me, uh, recipiunt. Uh, that would, uh, what is received is received according to the, the capacity, the circumstances of the one receiving. Uh, this certainly is brought out in what you point out, but I think that the capacity or the receptivity depends also on an, 
an anticipatory buy-in. Let me give an example, some examples from the ecumenical councils of the first seven. At the seventh ecumenical council, a period of terrible division within the Eastern Church and uh, itself, uh, at the council there were 300 and some bishops and over 130 monastics and others, not to mention the fact that the person presiding uh, had been a layman a couple months earlier, a, a leading civil servant. Uh, the element of buy-in was very necessary in order to have some schism, some difficulty overcome. This is the present difficulty, I believe, in uh, so much of Eastern Europe, especially, you were mentioning your lady in the cab or the bus, rather. Uh, I had a student uh, who was Slovak, actually. Uh, when the communists were in charge, we had to be ecumenical, but now we can be orthodox. This is a big problem because our mode of receiving, whether orthodox or Catholic, Eastern Catholic, is, much, is very much conditioned by the experiences of the 20th century. You know, I, I, would, I agree with everything you're saying. Thank you for emphasizing that, Father John. And I would simply add to that that what is, you know, uh, the age-old question, quid est veritas? Well, you know, what is truth today, especially today, when, I mean, every government lies, right? But we are living in a time when one government has excelled at that uh, in a way that uh, is just baffling to the mind. Um, the inheritor to the government that, uh, as the old anecdote used to say, there was no truth in Pravda and no news in Izvestia. Uh, so today, it is very difficult to find out what is really happening from Russia today. Um, it's hard to find out what's happening in Russia, and it's certainly even more hard to find out what's happening in Ukraine. So, there, where that fault line of uh, Orthodox Catholic relations really is the, the most painful, the bloodiest, there we have a crisis of truth. Can I believe anything? And uh, I have had that same remark that, that you mentioned thrown out to me many times, that we used we used to have to be ecumenical. Why? Because it was understood as a ploy by the communist authorities to infiltrate all kind of rural organizations, but it wasn't for real. And now we can be ourselves, which is orthodox in splendid uh, isolation. I think we're out of time, unfortunately, and all three people who just raised their hands, I would love to have heard from them because they're people that I have the greatest respect for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father Andri. Uh, we will break for uh, just about five to seven minutes. So for those three, Father Andri, is in here. Come get them real fast.